Welcome to our discussion on chi-square goodness of fit tests. You'll remember that in previous lessons we learned how to test the hypothesis that a population had a certain proportion of objects with a certain trait. You know, you would test the claim that 70% of the population uh, recognize uh, the brand uh, McDonald's or that 50% uh, of your population uh, believes in something, right? Or 25% prefer something. Well now with uh, the chi-square goodness of test you can take that idea and you ex can expand it to multiple categories. Before we had to have dichotomous data. Either things had the characteristic or they didn't and then therefore you, you got a p hat or a proportion of your sample that had that characteristic. Now we can have an entire spread of probabilities. The idea is instead of just having two categories, a yes and no kind of thing, you can have multiple categories and then you can have the proportion that each category should have and you're going to test whether or not your sample fits, right, has a goodness of fit to that proposed distribution. A simple example would be um, you're running for mayor of your city and you think your opponent uh, was stuffing the ballot boxes and cheating and they weren't very smart about it they just stuffed a bunch of uh, ballots in there and with uh, fake voters that were all registered the same way you know like they stuffed the ballot with a thousand people who were all registered as Democrats or all registered as Republicans well you know that the district that this voting box is in has a certain distribution of voters you know that the population of all registered voters in that district let's say is um, 35% um, Democrat. So your Democrat would be uh, 0.35. Let's say uh, Republicans are 30. Uh, independents, right, are, let's say, uh, 15. And then, um, you know, like other or n no affiliation is the other, what is that, 20%? Well, this is the distribution that you think should be in any random sample, i.e. you take any ballot box and the number of uh, you know, votes in that box that come from Democrats should be roughly 35% of the entire sample. And Republicans should be 30 and Independents 15 and non-affiliated should be 20. That's the idea of random sampling, that you should get a similar distribution to the population. And the chi-square goodness of fit test lets you take the observed, whatever your observed frequencies are, dot, 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 and you're going to compare them to what the expected frequencies should be. And it's basically saying, well, do they match close enough or not? So the hypothesis that we're testing is always that um, all of the distributions fit, right? Because remember, your distributions always have to add up to one. So if one of them is off, that means the other one has to be off as well, right? Something else also has to be off. You couldn't have in your sample something that was close to 35% uh, Democrat, close to 30% Republican, close to 15% Independent, and then be way off for 20% of non-affiliated because those numbers add up to 100%, right? And they would have to add up to 100% in your sample. So you're just ch checking that all of them match closely. Since we're dealing with a completely new type of test, we're dealing with a completely new set of notation. O is going to represent the observed frequency of each uh, outcome. So you'll have a separate O for each frequency. You would have a, a separate O that would represent the observed frequency of Democrat voters, the observed frequency of Republicans, etc., etc. And then E is the expected frequency of each outcome, right? The 35, 30, 15, and 20 that we had for our expected distribution of Democrats, Republicans, Independents, and non-affiliated. Uh, K is going to represent the number of different categories, so in our example there be four. And then N would just represent the total number of trials, meaning the size of your sample, how many uh, you know, total votes were in the voter box that you were testing. Okay, like all other tests, we have some requirements. In this case, 
um, the data have been randomly selected, which is what we always have as a requirement. Um, now our sample data have to consist of frequency counts, right? We have to be back to that kind of data that it's just how many of your data uh, pieces have this characteristic, how many have that characteristic, right? We're no longer concerned with getting numerical data, although we could have numerical data, but we would have to put them in some sort of uh, frequency, like you could think of grades, how many A's, B's, C's, D's, and F's you had, that type of thing. And then for each category, right, Democrat, Republican, Independent, uh, non-affiliated for our example, the expected frequency is at least five. Now remember when we when we wrote our expected frequencies, we wrote them as uh, percentages. You have to actually calculate an expected frequency as a number of things based on your sample size. So depending on how many uh, voters there were in that box, you would then multiply it by 35% to get the expected frequency of Democrats, and you would take the total sample size and multiply it by 30% to get the expected number of Republicans, et cetera, et cetera. And all of those expected frequency numbers have to be at least five. Please note that there's no requirement about the observed frequency for each category being at least five. It's just the expecteds have to be at least five. Okay, once we've uh, met all of those requirements, we can move on to actually running our hypothesis test. And our null hypothesis is going to be that all of the counts um, agree with what we expect, right? The observed accounts basically match closely to the expected counts, right? Frequencies. And then the alternative is that they don't match. Our um, test statistic is very simple. It's a chi-square test statistic, and it's just the sum of the differences between the observed and the expected squared divided by the expected. Very simple calculation to do by hand, but again, we can let technology do it for us. Just like before, we can either do uh, uh, our tests based on critical values or p-values. P-values are typically the ones that are used. They're easier to interpret. Critical values normally entail having to find values in tables, which can sometimes not be accurate. So it's better to do um, p-values whenever possible. Goodness of fit hypothesis tests are always right-tailed because of the, the question that we're asking and, and really the distribution of chi-squared. If you remember from previous lessons, chi-squareds are all positive, right? They go from 0 and above. Finding those expected frequencies, as we kind of discussed in our example with voters, the expected frequency is just going to be um, if if all things are considered equal, right? If if you should have an equal spread amongst all of your groups, then you just take the sample size n and divide by how many groups there are k, and then that gives you how many should be in each category. So if you thought your voter should be evenly spread amongst Democrat, Republican, Independent, and um, non-affiliated, then you would take the entire number of ballots in your ballot box and divide by four. And that would be how many you would expect to see in each category. However, if the frequencies are not assumed equal, then you very simply just take the size of your sample, right, and multiply by the probability, right, or proportion of that category. So in our example, if we had, uh, let's say, only a, a hundred uh, thousand, let's say, uh, votes in that ballot box, that's our N, and we said that uh, Democrats should be 35 right percent, then the expected value for Democrats would simply be 100,000 times 0.35, which is just 35, oh, 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 35,000. And that would be the expected number of votes we should see that were cast by people who are registered Democrats. The goodness of fit test, as we said, looks for close agreement. Not perfect agreement, just close agreement. And if you have close agreement between each observed frequency and each expected frequency, you'll end up getting a very small value for chi-square and a very large p-value. If you recall what the um, formula for chi-squared is, remember you're summing up 
the difference between the observed and the expected squared divided by expected. So if each observed frequency is really close to each um, expected frequency, this is going to be a really small number. Right? This piece here is going to be really small when those are similar. And a small number, whether it's positive or negative when you square it, is still going to be relatively small. And then you're going to divide by E, right? And then add them all up. You're going to get the sum of a bunch of small numbers, and you're going to get a really, really small chi-squared. Large disagreements, obviously, will give you the exact opposite. You get a big difference between these two numbers, then you square it, you get an even bigger number, right? You add them up, you get a really, really big number. So that's what's going to happen. It'll lead to a large chi-squared and then a small p-value. Significantly large just is like it always has been. If it's big enough for us to be able to reject that null hypothesis, it all depends on what we set alpha to be. Visually, this is what it's going to look like. If the um, O's and E's are all close, you get a small x value and it lands somewhere on the left on your curve. You fail to reject, right? O's and E's are far apart. You get a big X. It's out there in the tail in your rejection region, and you reject the null hypothesis. Let's look at another example. A random sample of 100 weights of Californians is obtained, and the last digit of those weights are summarized. So if you... Um, if one piece of data was a weight of 128 pounds, then you would just put an 8 down, right? The last digit. Now, when you obtain weights, it's extremely important to actually measure the weights of people rather than ask them to self-report it because most people will round. They'll just say, oh, I'm, I'm 125 or I'm 130, right? Or I'm 240 or 250. They're most likely going to round to zeros and fives rather than give you the more accurate reading you would get from a scale. So by analyzing the last digit, we can tell whether or not the weights were actually measured or if they were just reported. Because if they were actually measured, we would expect an even spread of that last digit. If you actually measured somebody's weight, there should be an equally likely probability that their weight ends in a 1, a 2, or a 3 versus any other number. However, if they reported those numbers themselves, you're going to see a lot more numbers ending in zeros and fives. So to test the claim that the samples from a population of weights in which the last digits um, do not occur with the same frequency, we can run a simple chi-square test. Here is the data. And you can see already from looking at the data, look at how big the numbers are right? for 0 and 5. They showed up so much more frequently than the other numbers without even running the test. You should already be thinking that most likely this is going to fail the chi-square, meaning that um, it's not an even spread. Okay, requirement check. The data are randomly selected, yes. The data consists of counts, yes. Right. The 100 sample va um, values have 10 categories, and since we're assuming equally likely, each category would have an expected frequency of 10, which is bigger than 5, so all the requirements are met, and we can proceed with our test. The null hypothesis, right, the original claim is that the digits do not occur with the same frequency. That means that at least one of them is different. Um, and then the opposite of that is that they're all the same. So the original claim is that at least one of them is different. The uh, opposite of that is that they're all the same. If we're going to put those into null and alternatives, the null is always the all the same version. right? So the null is that all of the proportions are the same. And then the alternative is that at least one of them is different. Uh, they didn't specify a level of significance, so we could select anything we want. We're going to go with the typical 0.05. And then, of course, we know that because we're looking for multiple P's, right, multiple uh, proportions lining up, that we're going to use the chi-square distribution. Here is um, <clears throat> a, a, sorry, a table showing each of the steps if you were to compute this by hand. And it's very simple. You can do this in Excel very easily. You have your observed frequencies, you have your expected frequencies. The first step is to compute all of these kind of deviation scores, right? How far uh, O and E are apart, so you do O minus E and you get all of these numbers. Then the next thing you do is you square all of those numbers. Then the next thing you do is take each of those numbers and divide it by its expected frequency. Now in this case it's 10 for all of them, but this makes a big difference when you have actual different <coughs> expected frequencies for each. <coughs> 
and these numbers are all of the the little deviations that have now been uh, you can think of normalized uh, to their expected values right you took deviation squared divided by what they should have been then you sum up all of that and you get a chi squared of 2128 well without even looking that up in a table they told us that large chi squares result in small p values that's a pretty big chi square and in fact you can look up the um, critical value in a table and get 16.9 212 is way beyond that, so we would know we would reject. If we use technology, it would spit out the test statistic and it would give us, it would normally report this. P is less than 0 0.0001, meaning that it's so small that it's, it's beyond this point. And in both of those cases, we would know that we would reject. So we reject the whole null hypothesis, which means that um, all of the proportions don't match what we think um, they should. Now, this test does not tell us which ones deviate from the expected values. We could obviously see that from looking at the frequencies that the fives and the zeros were off. And so that would help us to conclude that there is sufficient evidence to support the claim that the last digits do not occur with the same relative frequencies. In other words, we now have evidence that seems to support the, the idea that these weights were all self-reported rather than actually measured. But just realize that the um, chi-square test only tells you that there's a difference in the distributions. It doesn't tell you where that difference occurs. You have to kind of visually inspect it yourself and then say, well, it looks like you know this category is different or maybe these two categories are different. But it becomes, there are tests to determine where the differences lie. But with a, a standard chi-square goodness of fit, all it's telling you is whether or not there is a difference. All right, that's it.